So a while ago, I saw this tweet making fun of YouTube skeptics and their avatars. It was mildly amusing to me and a few friends of mine, but every time this picture got brought up, the response from everyone I knew was, why do all of these YouTube skeptics make avatars that look exactly the same? I actually have an answer to this question, but it's way more in depth than you might imagine. In fact, this picture right here and the YouTube skeptics in general are indicative of a massive culture-wide paradigm shift that has been happening since the 1980s. In this video, I'm going to answer why it is that these YouTubers all feature avatars in suits, but I'm also going to be talking about the paradigm shift and how these YouTubers are all just a smaller piece of a much larger picture that we need to be talking about. That bigger picture is how privilege and masculinity have been shaped by the rise of the internet. Now, before we get to the skeptics themselves, we need to lay a lot of groundwork for the history of the world that YouTube skeptics eventually found themselves occupying. This means we need to first talk about computer science. There's no clear answer for what happened, but sometime during the early 1980s, computer science as a field saw a major shift. Initially, women occupied a healthy place in computer science professions, but as personal computers started to enter into the picture and become a more household product, they were marketed as business and gaming related products, which were markets that were seen as catering to boys and men. This led to strain on the computer science field for women, which eventually led to the pushing out of women from the field of computer science altogether until it became a male dominated field. This was also followed by the gaming industry making a shift in marketing in the 1990s, away from marketing games as a family product into being a boy's product. While women were always part of the market and a part of the field of programming, the result of these shifts towards catering to an explicitly male demographic meant that eventually, by the end of the 20th century, men were making most of the hardware and software, and they were making them mostly for other men and boys. This shift may seem largely inconsequential, but ultimately has had dramatic consequences for how social interactions have been shaped in the resulting years. Another major shift that's important to discuss before we get to the skeptics themselves is, interestingly enough, 9-11. 9-11 was a pretty traumatic event at the time, but with it came a very conscious shift in public opinion. The combination of what was seen as an act of religious extremism, mixed with a highly conservative, explicitly Christian reaction from politicians and a lot of the public, led to the rise in prominence of the new atheist movement. Guys like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris appealed to a growing tension among the disillusioned and skeptical people of the time, in particular atheists and people whose faith had been shaken by the result of 9-11 in the Iraq War. They questioned the extremism and the foundation upon which that extremism seemed to rest. Religion was no longer a friend. Instead, they called for a return to the philosophies of the Enlightenment, exercising skepticism and scientific bases over faith and dogma. Then, one more major shift. The rise of social media and smartphones starting around 2005. There was MySpace and YouTube, and eventually Facebook and Twitter, and these websites and developments in technology brought with them an influx of people who had previously never been involved with the internet or kept internet usage to a minimum, either by choice, by circumstance, or by pure coincidence. The growth of the internet was, of course, gradual, but by about 2011, we had hit around 2 billion people using the internet, as opposed to 16 million as of 1995. This meant that the previously boys-only market that computer technology had brought with it would be a thing of the past by the 2010s. So what does any of this have to do with the skeptics? Well, simple. The skeptics are a perfect intersection between three subcultures. Nerd culture, gaming culture, and new atheism. All of these things, as well as the skeptics themselves, have a lot to do with how hegemonic masculinity has been shaped by the rise of the internet. For those who don't know, hegemonic masculinity is whatever configuration of masculinity is upheld as the standard for men in such a way that maintains male dominance at the expense of marginalized groups, particularly women, men of color, and LGBTQ people. What this means is that the societal narrative of what it means to be a man is one that will favor a particular kind of behavior and ideology that maintains dominance over others, and maintains a gender hierarchy over which cis, hetero, white men have power over everyone else. An example of hegemonic masculinity, historically, has been football players in high school. 
to be a football player in high school is to be the proper way of being a man within that social circle. If, by contrast, a boy in high school walked around wearing a skirt, this would be seen as improper and the boy would be bullied for it. Hegemonic masculinity is specifically masculinity that runs on the logic of power and domination, and in this sense, it is better to be a bully than it is to be bullied, according to the logic of hegemonic masculinity. Hegemonic masculinity is not something that people actually really have, but it's something that men are taught that they should want. The stereotypical narrative is that men should want to be physically strong, sexually aggressive, emotionally locked down, and incapable of any sense of vulnerability. This is not something that anyone can be all the time, but it's something that men are pressured to be endlessly, and thus narratives are constructed that allow us to maintain the false image that this is how people really are. What I mean by that is that it's not actually possible to, for example, be emotionally impenetrable at all times. The problem is, if a man allows himself to be emotionally vulnerable, then this will have him susceptible to being victimized, and according to the logic of hegemonic masculinity, it's better to be the bully than to be bullied. So men who are human beings capable of vulnerability and complex emotions are forced to often reject these emotions and hide them and just pretend like they're strong all the time. There are a lot of problems with hegemonic masculinity, but the main problems are this. First of all, it's just not a good thing to want to hold power over others. That really is just being a bully. Second of all, it's compulsory. Men are taught that they should want to be bullies, and while a lot of men don't want to be, most men face consequences for refusing to strive for hegemonic masculinity. It's seen as improper to be anything less than hypermasculine, and since hypermasculine is actually unattainable, it creates the tendency to pose strong and pose dominant in order to avoid being vulnerable themselves. In other words, if men don't desire being a toxic asshole, toxic assholes will try their hardest to force them into it regardless. All of this coalesces into a second place is the first loser mentality, where being on top is the only viable option, otherwise you're portrayed as worthless. This is the world men are forced into, and it's a really bad situation that has consequences for everyone. When men, particularly straight white men, are taught that their self-worth can only be defined by being a bully, then the temptation to bully and harm others, especially marginalized groups, becomes way too prevalent. The problem, of course, is that being a shithead doesn't actually create a sense of self-worth because it absolutely fails to address psychological or personal problems. Again, given that emotional vulnerability is seen as a fault, attempting to improve oneself emotionally is stereotyped as being weak and to a degree even feminine. Women are afforded the opportunity for introspection, but men often aren't, and so it creates a cyclical pattern of trying to achieve self-worth through domination, followed by only fleeting sense of accomplishment, leading to attempting to again achieve self-worth through domination. Eventually this becomes all too predictable. The skeptics relate to hegemonic masculinity because they have actually reinterpreted hegemonic masculinity in a way that is indicative of how much the internet has changed over one's lives. In the past, it was the football player, the jock, the physically strong man who was the stereotype that men were supposed to aspire to. Now, in the wake of the new atheist movement, it's the intellectually strong man, the skeptic, the enlightened that men aspire to, at least in this particular subculture. The reason why I brought up all this history is because it's actually all relevant to how this shift happened. The rise of personal computers and video games in the 80s, mixed with the shift towards marketing games to boys, meant that a lot of boys and men were the first early adopters of the internet. These weren't just any boys and men though, they were members of tech culture. Tech culture, of course, has intersections with nerd culture, which is itself a form of subordinated masculinity. Nerds are not the jocks, they are not the beacon of masculinity that are upheld as the standard. Nerds in the 1980s were not the bullies, they were the ones being bullied. But, like with any subculture, nerd subculture also brought with it a degree of masculinity issues from the men who occupied those cultures, and the gradual pushing out of women from gaming and computer science meant that, by the time the internet came to prominence, a large majority of people spending large amount of times on the internet were men and boys who were part of a culture that was victimized by toxic masculinity during that time. 
However, within the early internet culture, there was still male dominance of the space, which led to replicating toxic masculinity within these circles such as trash talking, trolling, harassing women and minorities, and maintaining a sense of anonymity that implicitly favored men above anyone else. The skeptics came onto the YouTube scene around 2007 or 2008, around the time that I first started using the internet more regularly, and during that time they were still part of the wave of new atheism, attempting to call for reason against the bigotry and easily debunked claims of Christian apologists and creationists. These guys were, to a degree, just hobbyists who enjoyed the process of logic and debate. However, they were also part of that very demographic. They were nerds, they were gamers, and they were atheists. These things were important parts of their identity in a time where the jock was still the upheld stereotype of what it meant to be a man, because these were things that displaced them from the mainstream. Christians were and still are the dominant force of religion in the West, and nerd culture was always seen as a sort of safe haven from the bullies of the world, and gaming was a thing by nerds for nerds. The male dominance that was prevalent in gamer culture in the early days of the internet eventually was strained by the increased popularity of the internet due to social media, and eventually, with billions of people using the internet, the internet and the many things that the internet are used for, including gaming, was no longer a thing just for nerdy guys. This mixed with the hegemonic promise of being able to achieve value through subordinating others, particularly women, people of color, and LGBTQ people, led to the infamous Gamergate fiasco in 2014. People who were supportive of Gamergate often like to claim it was a rally for ethics in gaming journalism, but the more commonly understood conclusion was that Gamergate was an anti-feminist hate mob. This isn't wholly accurate, though. Gamergate wasn't just anti-feminist, they were anti-woman. Gamergators didn't just want to keep feminists out of gaming, they wanted to keep women out of what they had seen as their spaces, specifically gaming culture and the internet at large. This is why Gamergate became so vile in their tactics. They weren't just trying to scare women away from critiquing games, they were trying to scare women away from showing their faces online at all. This has led to a political climate online in which a group of largely conservative white men attempt to maintain male dominance of all online spaces by bullying anyone who isn't like them or who doesn't explicitly cater to their viewpoints. The skeptics are important to this because the skeptics saw a huge sea change after Gamergate. Almost all of them, one by one, started being more openly anti-feminist, and the skepticism switched from debunking creationism to debunking feminism. This was almost exactly around the time Gamergate happened too, and I was there to witness it firsthand. Having been a fan of several of these skeptics, I saw a lot of them simultaneously make videos explaining that they were intending to switch away from creationism towards mocking feminists. I can't assume motivations for why this happened, but I can easily notice that they were shifting priorities from one intersection of their identity, that of being atheists, to another intersection of their identity, that of being gamers and part of nerd culture, and implicitly, that of being men. Less than a year after this shift in the skeptic community to anti-feminism happened, the paradigm shift towards an intellectual form of hegemonic masculinity had become complete. It was no longer the jock who was upheld as the standard of what it means to be a man. Instead, at least in most circles of the internet, it was now the intellectual who was upheld as the standard. The thing about hegemonic masculinity is that, as said before, it's essentially a form of bullying. So in this sense, yes, the anti-feminist community on YouTube are bullies. That's part of the nature of hegemonic masculinity. They pride themselves on maintaining an image of manhood that is powerful and strong, at the expense of those who are weak. In an intellectual capacity, this is done through owning others through argument. If they can make others look stupid, that is the key to showing off that they are, indeed, manly. And so the skeptic community and their legion of followers have taken to harassment and bullying in order to appeal to this new image of hegemony. This gets to part one of why they all wear those fucking suits. I call it the rational flex. By interpreting the power of manhood in an intellectual sense, rather than flexing strong physically, they flex strong psychologically through argument and debunking. Even these terms have changed in recent years with owned and destroyed being used instead of debunked, implying that making a more reasonable argument was somehow a, mo a power move rather than a diplomatic one. 
I call it the rational flex because they create an identity politic around being skeptics. This is a holdover from the new atheist movement that is still highly prevalent in the current anti-feminist movement. That being pro-reason and pro-logic is a way of framing themselves as already the victors of any debate they attempt to incite. If they are pro-reason, then it's only safe to assume by implication that those who they disagree with are somehow anti-reason. This is a form of poisoning the well by portraying themselves as already inherently smarter and more right than anyone they argue with. Granted they now largely argue with feminists, it portrays them on purely masculine terms. The discussion is no longer about learning or developing or empathizing. It's about winning. This is the rational flex. Portraying themselves as smart, flexing as more rational than those who go up against them in order to make themselves look more intellectually strong and thus somehow more right. They wear those suits to imply that they are intellectuals, that they are smart and sophisticated. This is also contrasted with the stereotype of the jock that is often upheld as the hegemonic image of manhood. The jock in a letterman jacket and holding a football is, when compared to the image of a man in a suit or tuxedo, almost kind of brutish. This is part of why this image is caught on. It's just a more sexy, more appealing look to be a man of what they might assume is the finer things like a tuxedo and a nice cigar. This is not something that is new to interpretations of masculinity. It's just something that has taken a front row seat in internet spaces that is an expression of masculinity. But there's more reason than just because it makes them look smart. There's also a sort of anonymity element at play too. Being able to hide behind a cartoon avatar in a suit does wonders for being able to maintain this image of being sufficiently masculine. I won't poke fun at people's appearances, I'm not, really not that type of person, but one of the benefits of being able to use a cartoon avatar in a suit is that it allows you to be a bit more than just a guy. When you inevitably reveal your face, the illusion is shattered. You're just some guy. Being able to appeal to an avatar creates a sort of mythical quality that lends itself well to hegemonic masculinity. Granted that hegemonic masculinity is not actually an attainable quality, having a persona external to the self that you can project onto is a means of embodying hegemony in theory without actually needing to be extraordinary in practice. This is quite literally the plot of Fight Club. None of us are Brad Pitt. We're not as good looking, we're not as ripped, we're not as cool or sexy or witty or deep or popular. The entire point of Brad's character in Fight Club is that men aren't actually like that, but they're taught that they need to be. In a sense, the avatars in suits are able to live up to this pro-reason, pro-rational flexing that the skeptics want to do. Even though they themselves are just normal everyday guys, their persona is able to present an image to the world that is something more than that. A deep intellectual, a powerhouse of reason and righteousness. This is all textbook sociology stuff, and when I say textbook, I mean that literally. I read about a lot of these concepts in a college textbook, and while the book wasn't talking about the skeptics, the book talked a lot about how masculinity is interpreted and reinterpreted by different subcultures in ways that both subverts and also maintains the dominant culture above them. The anti-feminist skeptics in suits are, in essence, the bully jocks of the internet. So why do I want to talk about them? Well, because they've become for gamergators what the new atheists were for the YouTube skeptics, a beacon of power through intellect. Gamergate was an attempt to reclaim the internet and gaming culture as a space by and for men, in a world where that's becoming increasingly less possible. The anti-feminist YouTube community is a way of playing to the tensions that gamergators have experienced as a result of the assimilation of nerd culture into the mainstream. It's a way of attempting to claim all social spaces online as a place for only them and those who agree with them. It's a way of maintaining hegemonic status on the internet. This is why masculinity has been reinterpreted in an intellectual way. You can't physically assault someone online. So in order to maintain dominance, you have to create a psychological power dynamic. So almost by necessity, masculinity has become an intellectual power game rather than a physical power game. Status is still a vital part of masculinity, except instead of being social status in the 1980s sense of the word, it's social status in the social media sense of the word. This completely reframes the way in which skepticism as a concept behaves online. 
Before, the true meaning of skepticism was to follow where the evidence leads and refuse to accept things at face value. Now, skepticism has become an identity politic that men use to maintain male dominance. Those goofy suits play into this identity politic, as well as the almost spam bot-like regurgitation of quotes like pro-logic or reels before feels. The problem is, because they've become a sort of beacon for gamergators and similarly angry men, typically conservative men, the skeptics and anti-feminists on YouTube have taken a very specific place in internet culture. In a sense, they've replaced guys like Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity as pundits for conservative ideology. Oftentimes, they don't even identify as conservatives, but they still push a narrative of masculinity that favors conservatism at its core. Being often anti-feminist, anti-social justice, and anti-trans or anti-LGBT in general, their views line up much more firmly with Rush Limbaugh than they do with someone like Bernie Sanders, as one example of a prominent left-wing figure. Rush Limbaugh, after all, was the man who came up with the term feminazi to slight feminists. This emphasis on intellectual masculinity and a growing insecurity about women's places in internet and gaming spaces has led to a significant shift towards right-wing ideology that has turned guys like Sargon of Akkad and Armored Skeptic into the new talk show radio hosts that work men up into a fervor against feminist and marginalized voices. There's a term for this, too. It's called aggrieved entitlement. When people with a large degree of privilege feel that the world isn't always catering to them, their sense of entitlement brings with it a targeting of people who lack those privileges. This is where anti-feminism as a concept comes from, and it has maintained a similar status in our culture since day one of its existence. An anti-academic, anti-progressive, anti-equality, anti-woman status. These things are all distinctly components of conservative ideology. Feminism as a branch of thought has had a healthy development through academia, various movements, and massive social changes brought about as a result of these things. The facts line up. Feminism works. Anti-feminism doesn't. Anti-feminism is only an act of attempting to maintain a status quo that is unfavorable to women, and this is pre precisely why the skeptics have become anti-feminist in the first place. Because they like it just fine when the internet and gaming are the way that they are now. They may not realize that they're in favor of a status quo that harms women, but that's what they support in their anti-feminist stance. If Gamergate wasn't a sign that anti-feminist ideology is extremely harmful, then I don't expect them to recognize this anytime soon. The wider trend of men attempting to maintain male dominance online through chilling and harassment campaigns is not something I've made up. It's been documented academically and by journalists, including most prominently in my mind, by The Guardian and Time. This has been going on for a while now, and the anti-feminist skeptics on YouTube are just figureheads that the trolls and harassers like to uphold as beacons of their ideology. That very ideology being one in which dominating the cultural space of the web by harassing women and other marginalized groups is tied to their identities both as gamers and as men. They flex their strength through appealing to reason and argumentation as tools of masculine power and use this to try to get anyone who doesn't look, think, or feel like them to shut up or go away. Because marginalized voices aren't going away, and because social justice and feminist communities are gaining traction both online and in person, these groups of trolls and harassers have become increasingly loud and aggressive in attempts to continue to feel as though they are the winners of the internet space. Given that crowdfunding allows these YouTubers to make large sums of money off of these groups, social media spaces have become all too prevalent with guys using avatars of various suited animals, creatures, and other things in order to make money off of a trend that is only self-sustaining so long as they constantly run on the logic of toxic masculinity. This is why they make so many response videos and so frequently post content. Not only does it generate more money, but it generates more conviction in the self-righteousness of their audience and makes their following continuously dedicated, so they keep paying money. This isn't to say that the YouTubers are sellouts. I do think they fully believe they're doing the right thing, and they do fully believe that feminists are bad, but this is because they've been taught that self-worth is dependent on a showcase of dominance, and an underlying fear of emasculation leads to a constant need to go on the offensive. 
They can't just talk about their personal lives or experiences. They need to always be going after some sort of target. Whether it's Steve Shives or Anita Sarkeesian or Zoe Quinn or Riley J. Dennis or Zinnia Jones or Sean the Skull Guy, there needs to be someone they can defeat, so to speak. The irony is that these people that they go after continue to just be people, disinterested in picking fights and waging a war over who holds the intellectually dominant position. The anti-feminist community wants domination, because anything less would leave them vulnerable. And guys like this just aren't equipped to process vulnerability in a healthy way, especially when they're in the view of hundreds of thousands of viewers who will drop them the moment they let vulnerability weaken them. What this all means is that they end up in an extremely predictable pattern of behavior avatars and suits, rallying behind identity politics of skepticism, rationality, and enlightenment, response videos, harassing people on social media, challenging the latest top targets to specifically live debate so that they can maintain control over the conversation, making textbook misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, and racist comments, and arguing against anyone who calls them out on their shitty behavior. They refuse to admit when they were wrong, avoid accountability, and try to turn every conversation onto their terms. They don't care about learning and instead care about owning, and so their content will often poison the well for anyone or anything they discuss, which is why you see things like This Week and Stupid be the name of their videos. I guess the last question to ask is, what do we do about this? It all comes down to a phrase that we've so often heard, don't feed the trolls. By that, I'm not saying don't talk to these guys. I'm saying stop feeding the logic that their ideology runs on. On a bigger level, we need to stop harassment online by pushing for more strict policies and maintaining a peaceful space on social media sites like Twitter and YouTube. On an individual level, this means we need to stop playing their game of win winners and losers, and instead disengage from the toxic tactics that they employ. Rather than obsessively fighting back on their terms, we need to give them no fuel to work with. It's important that we don't make every conversation with them about being right or about being stronger or about making them look stupid or weak or pathetic. It's more important that we recognize that hegemonic masculinity runs on a logic of maintaining power over others, and that this new shift towards using intellect and skepticism as a tool to maintain power over others is a vital part of what's creating a toxic culture online. From there, we can work against this without appealing to the same logic. Personally, I think it's important to humanize ourselves, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, because it shows that we're human beings and that we aren't concerned with being strong, but more into progressing and developing as people. It's important to allow ourselves to be wrong and to be openly willing to recognize publicly when we've made errors or mistakes. It's important to pick apart people's arguments for their logical and moral failings, rather than making it all about the person making the argument. It's important to recognize the value of subjectivity and bring about a more intersectional perspective in any discussion, humanizing people rather than treating groups as statistics, reducing us to nothing more than ammunition in a debate. It's important to not emasculate people, because this is ultimately a form of gender policing. I could go around making jokes that guys who I disagree with have tiny dicks or need to get laid or are ugly or whatever mean-spirited bullshit, but this doesn't dissuade toxicity. It only encourages it. It's also important to not let their reactions shape our content and use academic and personal backgrounds to our benefit. Ultimately, it's not like it's a war between feminists and anti-feminists, as much as some people would like to pretend it is. Really, it's just a case of a large vocal group of trolls and harassers being toxic and trying to maintain the internet as a space by and for straight white men only. The less options they have of enforcing this ideology, the less likely they'll be to continue doing it. So we need to raise the platform of content creators and audience participants who are not so privileged. This tension has been forming slowly over several decades with the development of computer science and the internet, as well as the intersections between these things and toxic masculinity through the lens of nerd culture. We're currently in what I see as a sort of bleeding out stage where the continuing irrelevance of male dominance online is leading to a more aggressive backlash than 
than we ever saw in previous years. The skeptics didn't start this backlash, but they are certainly riding a wave of support from this backlash and are continuing to fuel it with their content. If we want to do anything about this backlash and make the internet a more welcoming place to everybody, we need to understand where these feelings come from and the kind of logic they operate on. And I hope that this video has been at least a little informative as to why the YouTube skeptic community has seemingly turned a dime so suddenly towards being so explicitly bully-like in their behaviors. That's it for this video, though I do want to say that I don't hold any personal grudge against these guys or their fans. I just think that they're indicative of a larger problem of communities on the internet pushing marginalized voices out with toxic behaviors, and I want to discourage these toxic behaviors any way I can. So I made this video to sort of examine where these behaviors came from in a sociological sense. I am a college student myself, and living in the US and all, it's pretty difficult to be able to afford college, so I've set up a Patreon account to use this channel as a source of revenue that I can help use to afford college. I still haven't figured out how I want to handle the Patreon account, but I know that I only intend to use Patreon money to help fund this channel and college, and I'm most likely not going to be using the money for anything else besides those two things. Though if that changes, I will be sure to say so. You're free to watch my videos without donating, but if you'd like to support content like this, you're free to donate, and any money given is greatly appreciated. You can also check out my Twitter at Malmrose Project. Both things will be linked in the description, and as always, thanks so much for watching. You are loved.